Hi, this is Matt State with Martial Arts GB Group. So today I'm talking to Julian Dale, who's agreed to join us. Hi, Julian, how are you? Uh, good morning, Matt. I'm very good, thanks. Awesome, awesome. So just before we start, what I'd like to do is just to get, if you wouldn't mind, just to give us a, a, an overview of, of who you are and what you do, just in case some people haven't quite heard of you. Sure. I run uh, England's oldest full-time Eagle Claw Kung Fu school. Uh, we're the only, only school in the whole of the UK. I also represent the Eagle Claw family out of the founding village in uh, North China, in an area called Hebei, which is about an hour and a half to two hours drive outside Beijing. Uh, so the school's been going full-time since 1997. We teach Northern Chinese Ying Zhao Fan uh, also Tai Chi and Qi Gong, which I've been doing for 30 years. We run a traditional Fatsan style uh, lion and dragon dance team. What else do we do? We do traditional Chinese medicine, Ditta, uh, which has been passed down and taught to me by my teachers. We have all the conditioning and all the old Chinese uh, power training methods in the school. So yeah, it's a, it's a good school for kids, teenagers, adults. Right, awesome. Yeah, no, that sounds amazing. And some really interesting stuff there that I'm hoping we can sort of talk about as we as we move on. So, um, what started you in your martial arts in the first place? What began your journey? Uh, well, I was I had quite a, a difficult uh, childhood through school with a lot of bullying. Uh, I think like, a lot of people went through different different things like this. And for me, it was watching the old. Uh, sort of Chinese martial arts TV programs like The Water Margin and then Monkey on TV in my youth, as many others of our, my age at 53 now saw as well. And uh, yeah, so when I watched all of that and, and some of the Chinese Jackie Chan films and what have you, that was it. I just thought, well, yeah, I'll have some of that. So uh, I started my journey. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, again, people of a certain age, as you said, the water margin of monkey I grew up with as well and, and had a huge bearing on how I sort of saw the martial arts. Um, so that, that led you, what, to, to look specifically for, 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 the, for Chinese Kung Fu kind of things? or Well, I started off doing, so I found a, a local club which was doing sort of Chinese kickboxing um, back in the early days. And then I, I wanted a bit more because it wasn't authentic or deep enough for me. So I found a Northern Shaolin school in the UK um, and I just got totally and utterly obsessed with that. And I wanted more and more. I just wanted to get deeper and deeper and deeper into it. So I had a friend over here who was from Hong Kong. Um, I'd never left the country before, never, well, Isle of Wight was as far as I'd been overseas, never flown. And uh, my, my friend helped me get a plane ticket and that was it. I just flew to Hong Kong, didn't know anybody. I, I managed to track down the address of the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Arts Association on a bit of paper. My friend helped me find somewhere to stay, didn't speak the language, didn't eat the food, didn't know anything, never left the country. That was it. I was off and I arrived in Hong Kong on a really hot, hot, steamy day in the old crazy Kai Tak airport, which was like a, a roller coaster flight if, if people haven't been there in those early days. Literally, the, the plane dive bombs into Hong Kong and lands on a, a, a runway out into the sea. So that was it. That was how I started. I just had a bit of paper for the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Arts Association. And I wasn't going to let anything stop me from getting to the depths of, of real, old, authentic Kung Fu. And that's it. Just went off and right. stayed there for six months. And that was, that was my journey. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, most, most of us just find the local leisure centre and begin there, but obviously that's not good enough for you. So how old were you when you did that? Because that's a, that's a heck of a step to take. I think it was about 20 when I did that. I mean, back in those days, you know, if you wanted to find somebody's phone number, you went to the phone box in the yellow pages. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to find something, you had to look at it on a map. I mean, it really was just one of those things that um, I wasn't... I needed to get into the, the real sort of old Chinese Kung Fu because that's all I wanted. Um, and uh, yeah, it was quite an adventure to say the least. I was up at four o'clock every morning, training up in the mountains, overlooking Clearwater Bay with uh, some Northern Shaolin teachers. And then I just, I just carried on getting deeper and deeper into it and uh, you know, finding out more and more about the systems that were of interest. Yeah, wow, yeah. D did you find any resistance when you first got there? I mean, obviously the language is going to be an issue to begin with, but was there any kind of, um, 
I, I don't know, was, was there any kind of process where you had to, if you like, show that you really wanted to be there and learn? Yeah, I think very much, uh, we're very fortunate, especially being English, that Hong Kong was a colony and still a colony in those days. Um, and very, very, uh, very heavy westernized influence there. Um, and fortunate also that I knocked on the doors of the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Arts Association who knew everybody and everybody was connected and linked. Um, and it was a process very much of introductions. You, you do your time, they, there's constant viewing and testing of you. Um, and it is a process that you go through. And it's not so much more about their resistance, it's more about your resistance as a guaylo or a foreigner going over there. You really have to kind of open your mind and your heart to the way they do things. And if you don't, if you don't do that, if you don't immerse yourself in the culture, the thinking, and the process, the doors don't open to you, and the martial arts don't open to you in the way that uh, is, is taught in Chinese culture. Well, I think uh, you could you could argue that that's a uh, a universal with regards to you know you get you get out what you sort of give in kind of thing so there's an element of that to that but with regards to you it was the um because we're all familiar if you like with the the movies and the way the training used to be in the 70s and you know in those films kind of thing so did you actually uh, be party to that style of training or was it slightly different for your own journey um the, the training is very much on a f uh, familial family basis. Um, you've got your sihings and, and, and your sijers and, and your older brothers and older sisters and the way the structure is very structured on Confucian uh, uh, protocol. Um, the mindset and the culture is different. It's, it's not like you can just go in here, pay your money, teach me this, give me this, give me that, I want. you. It doesn't work like that in Hong Kong. You get what you're given and you patiently work diligently um and there's there's a process there's a process that you go through the training yeah i was i was training eight hours a day six days a week professional training um and then uh i, I followed one teacher to america for a, a good few years where i would continue training the eagle claw system in america mm. and then i wanted to get deeper into the into the old system of eagle claw so i started traveling into china uh, and my Tai Chi teacher was from China, so I'd already been uh, training Tai Chi and Qigong with him in, in Hangzhou, which is in Zhejiang province, West, West China. Um, but in 2006, I really felt I needed more out of the Eagle Claw system that I've been working on since sort of 1994. Um, so I started tracing the, 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 the migration and the journey of the Eagle Claw system from the north of China uh, as it came down from uh, Beijing, Hebei into Tianjin, and then down into Shanghai, um, across into Guangzhou and Hong Kong. Um, and I, I'm the first Westerner that's fully, fully traveled the journey from sort of like West all the way through from Hong Kong, Fatsan, Guangzhou, along to Shanghai, and then back up to Tianjin, Hebei and Beijing. So I, I kind of did a historical survey and research journey and really, really found out an awful lot more about the Eagle Claw system which took me to the founding village um, it, called uh, Guzhuang Tou, which is in uh, Xiongshan, which is part of Hebei. Hebei is connected to Beijing. And I was able to access a level and uh, a level of the system that I'd not been exposed to before. Um, and I just started spending more time in China and eventually went on to become uh, an accepted lineage family disciple within the, 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 the source family at the root, the very birthplace of the system. Um, and I'm the only, in, Chi in, in Cantonese they call a guaylo, which is you know, a, a white foreigner, a uh, law fan in, in China. So I'm the only Westerner that's been accepted as a lineage disciple within the closed door of the family in uh, uh, Guzhuang Tou, which is the, the founding village, which is a, an absolute privilege and honor for me um, and has, tremendously enhanced my understanding and awareness and training and methodology of the system Eagle Claw um, uh, as I now know it. So uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting journey. Um, and now I find myself back at the source, if you like. So uh, it's a very yeah. rustic old farming village that's right off the beaten track. It is dirt roads and brick houses, single brick houses, but the family there is amazing. And, and the training is, is very deep. Um, 
and it's yeah it's it's what i always wanted and it, i just had to take a long journey to get there um and it, it's opened opened the system up to me at levels deeper levels that i hadn't come across before well that's an amazing um uh, you know an amazing responsibility as well that, that that has been sort of given to you uh with regards to being accepted into that i mean what an incredible journey so um one of the things that i would ask on that because it's something mm. that i remember uh, during you know when i was a young man trying to experience different things and trying to afford to travel and all that kind of stuff so um you said you spent a few years in america as well how did you sort of finance all of that as a young man well, what I would do is I would spend extended periods of time training with a teacher uh, in America. I would come back, work crazy, yeah. uh, crazy amounts of hours and still maintain my training. So I would train before an hour before I'd go to work. I'd try and find time in my lunch hour to train for a bit. And I would train three or four hours every night as well and continue that level of intensity um, in my training. So I would come back UK, work really hard for five months. <clears throat> and then just go back out and uh, continue training. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the joys of being a young man, isn't it? Having all that energy and vitality where you can do that. Um, again, remember, I remember those days well myself, and uh, I, I sort of so missed... why. <laughs> so, um, so, so, so that's an incredible journey, and that's and that's really where you embedded all that sort of knowledge. And and there's no there's no denying that the the the, the things you must have learned during that are incredible. I mean, I. I I'd love to hear more about that as, as we sort of go along. But so that brings you now to coming back to the UK and actually setting up your your own school. Did you, uh, I assume that you'd need permission and things for that? Well, yeah, I, I initially started as, as most people do, you know, I was teaching in community centres and, and uh, small places just to, and even just teaching out my garage, um, just teaching people that gravitate towards you. And then just slowly over time, more people come together. So let's open a, a, a full-time Mogwon and uh, do that. So I had a small thousand square feet um, in Maidenhead, which is where I teach, a small building. Um, and that was very busy. That was uh, uh, the first full-time martial arts center in Maidenhead back in 97. There wasn't, there wasn't anywhere else. Um, and then we kind of outgrew it. So I think, what 17 years ago 16 years ago i moved to a larger uh to 2300 square foot top floor of a warehouse um and it is is fully equipped with all the right training equipment it has all the ancestral tables the ulcers to the past masters all the calligraphy wall hangings weapons i've got over 20 lions here chinese lions so it's it's a uh, a very unique environment to train authentic Chinese martial arts school, uh, Kung Fu. So it's, it's both, it's the correct environment, it has the correct energy, the correct transmission from, from the, the family, uh, the, the correct, everything is correct in terms of authentic transmission down from the family through here. So this is the European headquarters for the system, it's the only place in Europe that represents the, the the family from the village in North China. Right. No, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. So the um, it's your 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 club is called Eagle Claw. So is that the is that the name of the system, or is that just the overarching term that you use uh, and you do several things within that? Well, on my on my badge here, if you like, we have uh, a, a red seal, which is 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 all 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 of our branding and logos, if you like. It says Eagle Claw Kung Fu School UK. So we need. Um, uh, something that's easily recognizable within a Western mind uh, and Western reading. Um, it has the, the, the name of the system in Chinese within it, the eagle that represents our, our system. And then, then the, the two lines of characters here, uh, they say that, you know, this, these two lines here is Zhu uh, Ting Ying Zhao Fan Zimen Ying Guo. So this is the Zhu Ting Ying Zhao. Zhu Ting means uh, ancestral eagle claw system and it's the eagle uh, uk or english branch so um yeah you can find us eagle claw kung fu school um uk easy to find on the web website is eagle claw kung fu dot uk um easy to find on the web and there's all the information about the system the family and you know, the heritage and everything else that goes with it right awesome yeah so one of the 
one of the other things that uh, that you do which i'm quite interested to to learn more about because i i i I remember seeing it as a young young man and just being absolutely blown away by the beauty of it and the athleticism of it and that has never gone away it's still just as magic to see now as it ever was and that's the wonderful lion dance and you guys you actually have a team for that yeah i have a, a youth sort of a teenage kids teenagers and adults um and we teach the fatsan which is for shan area which is very close to hong kong so the hong kong style of lion dance is, is very much influenced by Foshan uh, or Fatan. Uh, so yeah, we have 20 lions. I, I've become, you know, lots of people collect shoes or watches. I, I collect lions. So I've got about 20 odd here now. Um, going back, uh, you know, a good sort of 20, 25 years. So uh, that's, a, that's a great cultural thing that the school does. We're very busy through Chinese New Year. Uh, we organize a huge lion dance uh, parade in our local town where um, we have about 3,000 people come out to watch every year. We have five or six lions and all the flags and the banners. So it's a real cultural experience for everybody. And it's about giving back to the community and, and also letting people enjoy these, these amazing things that we do. Yeah, no, it's all, as I say, it's always something that I've looked at with, with genuine sort of awe and wonder. Um, because coming from a, a kid of a certain age, sort of the Chinese Kung Fu was, was huge, you know, for, for a long, long time. And that was, that was most yeah. of what we saw in television and things. Um, and I remember, you know, being able to see it for the first time years later. And it was, it was just as impressive, if not more so. Um, so is, is there, are there sort of different types of lines? Do they have meaning? Because... Again, normally they're different colours, but, but what do they represent? Yeah, there are uh, traditional uh, lions. You'll, you'll have representation from the, the four brothers of the, the legend of the three kingdoms. So there are uh, there, there, there's five brothers, and, and, but you'll see predominantly three used. One is Lao Bay, which is a sort of rain. I say rainbow colour, but it's not rainbow colour. It's rainbows, different colours but with white hair and a white beard. Uh, Lao Bei is the oldest of the three brothers, so he has white hair. Right. Then you have uh, Guan Gong, who uh, is the patron saint of martial arts, and his colors are red and black, and he was a general. Right. Then you have Zhang Fei, whose colors are black and green. Uh, he was younger, um, was like a, a captain, military captain. Uh, his energy is very, strong very powerful so when you first start doing lion dance publicly you, you you go through a process of using one of the three brothers you start with Zhang Fei because Zhang Fei is <clears throat> not aggressive but very aggr his movement is very sharp and very uh, powerful in so much as he he shows his strength so when you start using lion uh, a lion you should use Zhang Fei Zhang Fei is because you're a new school and that's sort of two to two to five years you should be out in public using Zhang Fei. Then at five years onwards you would use Guan Yu, you Guan Gong, you're more established, so you're more coming up in the, the ranks of lion dance, you can you can show that your position is a little higher. And then sort of eight, ten years onwards, you use Lao Bei because he's the most senior. So you can bring all three brothers out, which shows the length of your lion dance. Um, but lion dance is a lot of people, not a lot of people, are not doing it as as right as they should be. So, a lion should be awakened. What they call dimting, which is the eye dotting ceremony, right. and the a lion should be awakened in front of the ancestral tables, so that is empowered. Because lions are very closely linked with uh, feng shui or feng shui, right. they have a role, a purpose, which they must be empowered and energized to do. And without that empowerment, there's no blessing for the lion performance that you're doing. So you're not actually bringing any good to it. Right. So it's, lion dance is very deep. It's not just a performance of, of, you know, like a pantomime. It has a lot of a lot of meaning to it. And there's a lot of protocol, a lot of things you should do, a lot of things you shouldn't do. So it's almost like a complete Kung Fu system in its own right. So yeah. when you see lions performing and they don't have the... the the hong fa, red flower or red ribbon on their on their horn. It means that they they, they haven't been awakened properly. So they, they they can't bring any blessing or power to what they're doing, whether it's opening a new restaurant, means you can't bring the prosperity. 
if you're doing the, a blessing for the birth of a baby boy, there's no blessing there. So it's very deep. And that's what I mean about the culture. When you, when you want to learn Chinese Kung Fu, you need to get into the culture. You need to get into the mindset because there's an energy that goes with it all. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's deep. Yeah, no, totally. And again, regardless of, of art style or geographical location, I, the, fundamentally the best, um, the, the best sort of people that I, that, I, that I know of or spoke to or have heard about are always people that are looking at martial arts, not just from a physical point of view. They are, they are people that see the, the if you like, the holistic approach. Um, and it's the, it's the mental elements are just as important. So for, for you, with regards to that then, when you're looking at your, um, your, your training and what you teach, is that something that you, that you look for in your students? Are you looking to, to teach them on every level, not just the physical? Well, I think students, anybody who comes to martial arts, comes to martial arts for their own reasons. Over time, they become more aware of what the, the Kung Fu school is all about. So for them, they just come to get healthy, they learn some self-defense, they want a community, they want to socialize. Um, and over time, they become more aware and, and understand that, that this is not just like a, a pay and go, kicky punch stuff, which is fine. It's, it's very much dependent on what you want. As students become more understanding of what a Kung Fu school really means, then they start to kind of get deeper into it because they want to understand more. So they start learning more deeply. So it's the same thing. Kung Fu means a skill or attribute developed or acquired over a period of time. So their, their knowledge changes, uh, their, or, sorry, their awareness changes. So they start to look more deeply. So we start to teach more deeply. But yeah, we, 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 when we're teaching, we, we are looking for certain attributes in people. And if they're not there, we try and guide and develop and coach people. So my, my job is to pass on the system with the correct transmission from my ancestral lineage. Um, and some people say lineage doesn't matter. It's whatever it means to you as a person. And some people it doesn't matter. Some people it does matter. But in our school, we have a very strong family connection right back to the source. So this is something that flows through us, uh, all of us that have been together for a long time. So we do call ourselves Kung Fu brother, Kung Fu sister. And, you know, we have very strong bonds that are not easily broken. Um, yeah. So, um, again, it's, 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 it, the same thing applies, I think, throughout. I mean, regardless of... Um, what style you do or whether you're if you like more into sporting elements or what have you uh, there's no denying that we stand on the shoulders of giants and whatever knowledge we have now whatever training we have now we owe a debt to all arts of all styles that you know that's brought us to this place absolutely um, but one of the things that you you seem to sort of put a lot of all, um, a lot of weight behind which I actually agree with is that you know is is is, is showing clearly that there's a history and we should not just acknowledge it but be grateful for it and then pass that on as part of that line that lineage if you will so it's our responsibility to pass on what we've learned in the best way possible yeah i think we have to follow the ethics i mean in chinese martial arts we have something called in cantonese they call it molda in in mandarin it's called wuda. these are the ethics of of, of martial arts so you've got to have you know, these things are, uh, it's, it's like in Japanese, is what they call budo, yeah? You've got to be righteous, loyal, yeah, have integrity, honesty, dedication, perseverance, all, all these good character qualities. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's something that flows through all martial arts. And we've got to try and, we have to aspire to inspire those, those character traits within all of our students, uh, depending on where they are in their, in their own life's journey. Because as martial arts teachers, uh, we are sharing a portion of a student's life journey. And what we do within that portion of their life journey, whether it's six months, six years, or a lifetime, is we must instill and share the very best qualities of ourselves as a human being, but also the best qualities of the martial arts, um, the the, the Mouda, Buddha or Budo way of the Bud, way of Budo way or what have you, um, and that's that's an important principle as well. Yeah, totally agree, totally agree. So, if people are 
uh, wanting to know more about what it is and what you do. I know you mentioned it briefly just a little while ago, but if we can, uh, if you can just let people know how they can find you. Yeah, we're on Facebook, Eagle Claw Kung Fu School UK. Our website is uh, all the W's, eagleclawkungfu.uk. So we're, we're pretty easy. If you search my name, Julian Dale, um, Eagle Claw, it, yeah, there's far too much on, on me on the internet as well. Right. Um, notorious more more or less uh, love me or hate me i'm passionate about what i do and i'm passionate about passing on the the eagle claw system of our family and also the tai chi and qigong that i've been studying with with my teacher for many years um we just to try and do the best that we can and 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 you know be a and provide something that's that's good within the community within the world really create positive impact Excellent. Excellent. Well, Julian, thank you ever so much for taking the time out of your day and coming and speaking with us. It's been really, really interesting and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm actually on the back of this now. I am really, and I mean this genuinely, I am actually going to go out and spend some time trying to research a bit more about the lion dance stuff because there's so much depth in that that I wasn't aware existed. So thank you for, um, for pointing that out to me. And it's been a great pleasure chatting. So thank you very much. You're very well. Thanks very much for having me on, Matt. It's a privilege to, to be able to share some of this unique Chinese Kung Fu culture with everybody. So thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to do that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.